Good evening, everyone. Jennifer LeClaire here, Senior Leader at the Awakening House of Prayer, founder of Awakening Magazine. Tonight, talking with Robert Henderson, Apostle Robert Henderson has been so gracious to join us tonight. He is a global apostolic leader who operates in revelation and impartation. His teaching empowers the body of Christ to see the hidden truths of Scripture clearly and apply them for breakthrough results. He's driven by a mandate to disciple nations through writing and speaking. He travels all over the world, teaching on the apostolic, the kingdom of God, the seven mountains, and of course, many of you know him for his books on the courts of heaven. He's been married uh, to his beautiful wife, Mary, for 40 years. They've got six children and five grandchildren. So he's a busy guy, and he's taken some time out tonight to be with us uh, to talk about his new book, Receiving Healing from the Courts of Heaven. Apostle Robert Henderson, thank you so much for being with us on the broadcast tonight. It's great being with you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited about being here with you. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while since we actually sat down and talked, but uh, your publisher, uh, Destiny Image, Larry Sparks, is a dear friend of mine. And uh, when I saw your new book coming out, I said, Larry, we got to grab Robert and let him talk to the audience. And uh, this going out to thousands of people tonight. So uh, we, are, we are all just hanging on uh, every word that you have. You know, many people, you know, they, they, they don't understand. And really, it's a mystery in many cases why some people get healed and why some people don't get healed, why people see miracles and why other people, you know, stay in a wheelchair, die of cancer. And, and, and tonight, you know, we, we want to make very clear, first of all, that God's will is to heal. Uh, and, and, and so some of the answers, I think, uh, to, to the, the plaguing question that we find are, are in your new book. So I, I want to sort of jump right into that. Uh, for all the people whose prayers for healing go unanswered. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's just kind of jump right in here. Hindering, spirit, hindering spirits, um, what, do you, what do you see some of the hindering spirits or, or maybe the, 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 the most, the top spirit, the, the most common spirit that would, that would hinder someone's healing? Yeah, well, you know, um, of course, the whole principle flows out of that my, my concept or my belief that, that everything is, or many things, every, I would say everything is legal in the realms of the spirit. Uh, for instance, when Jesus died on the cross, that was a legal transaction. I, I usually say it was the greatest legal transaction of history because what he did on the cross when he, when he said in John 19.30, it is finished, what that was was a legal statement that every legal thing that is necessary for redemption to come to the earth for reconciliation to come to the earth, for God to reclaim the earth and all the people and, and the cultures in it and everything, uh, Jesus had just, through what he did on the cross, set that in place. And uh, we have been now for 2,000 years executing that verdict into place in the earth. And the ultimate of that will be when there's a new heaven and there's a new earth because Jesus bought and paid for all that, but the legality, the legal realm of it, was established at the cross. And the same is true in healing, that when Jesus died on the cross, according to Isaiah 53, verse 4, that he carried away our sicknesses and he bore away our pains. And so the legal work that needed to be done to, this is the way I put it, to make sickness Mm -hmm. and disease illegal, to make it illegal uh, for the believer, that has been done. Uh, But the enemy, uh, and and so some people would say, and I just need to say this up front, some people would say, Mm -hmm. well, now, wait a minute. If Jesus did all that, then why do we have to do anything? You Mm -hmm. know, why do we have to do this repentance? Why do we have to do all all this kind of stuff? I said, because... In, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter said, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. That is the Greek word antidikos, and it means the one who brings a lawsuit. So Peter had an awareness that the devil was the one who was operating in a legal position to build a case and to bring a lawsuit. And he said he, he, he goes about to and fro, if you will, searching things out, that he might uh, find a reason to cause a legal right to devour us from. And, of course, that's what sickness is. It's a devouring force. And mm-hmm. so I, t- I tell people, I say, okay, if what you say is true, that Jesus did everything and I don't have to do anything, which, by the way, I do believe he finished the work. 
But if that's true, then why did Peter say you have to be on guard? You have you have to you have to you have to be yes. aware that you have a legal opponent that is seeking a legal right to devour you. And, and that at times we have to know what those things are and be able to undo them so that the full benefit of everything Jesus died for us to have can really become reality. And that's, that's kind of the whole basis for the book. Um, and, and then I go into some issues of, of, of trades and, uh, and it's kind of a different language, trades, covenants, and dedications that gives the enemy a legal right to sometimes claim bloodlines so that mm-hmm. we have to say, no, wait a minute, I belong to Jesus by his blood. And so we go before the courts and we establish that we belong to Jesus and that any and every legal right of the enemy has been revoked and annulled by my agreement with what Jesus has done for me on the cross. And that agreement comes through faith, it comes through decrees, it comes through repentance, it comes through you know any number of different things that I come and I set myself in agreement with the finished works of Jesus so that those things are moved out of the way. So anyway, that's kind of the basis from which we function and from, and from which the book has been written. So you almost might say that it, it, at some level, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you said this, but this is what I this is what I sort of take away from that is it's almost like there's a certain ignorance of the, the, the legal realm. I mean, the enemy is legalistic, and the Bible says not to be ignorant of his devices. So if he's got something, you know, a legal right that he's found against us, and we're not aware of that legal right, then he's got an unfair advantage, and we're not able to overcome it if we don't know it. Like you don't know what you don't know. That's exactly right, and that's and that's where, of course, I functioned for years. And and the thing that really brought all of this to light to me was well, there were several things, but the main thing was in the book of Luke when Jesus's disciples asked him to teach them to pray. And I began to see that he said in Luke 11, uh, verse uh, 2, he said, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven. We know that. Well, he, mm-hmm. he, Jesus began to teach them, approach God as Father. But then in Luke eleven five, as he continued to teach, he said, and which of you having a friend? And so all of a sudden he says, now wait, not only do you approach him as Father, but now you need to know how to approach him as friend as well, which is a whole other realm. But then he leaves that there, and in Luke 18 comes back to the subject and picks it up and begins to talk about an unjust judge that a widow got a verdict from. And, of Mm -hmm. course, Jesus wasn't saying God's an unjust judge you have to convince. He was saying if this widow could get a verdict from an unjust judge, how much more can we step into the judicial system of heaven and get a verdict from God, the righteous judge of all the earth? So he brought the third dimension in, which is approaching God as judge, and that's where the legal realm is. So I can come before God as Father and ask him for those things that I need because he's my Father. I can approach him as friend uh, into the counsel of the Lord and, and see things shift to move, but there are times I need to know how to go before him as the judge and see any and every legal thing the enemy would be using against me revoked and removed based on what Jesus has done so I can get the full benefits of what Jesus has for me. Yeah, I can see that. Now, as you say this, what comes to mind is that we really, in order for us to have the faith to enter the courts of heaven and to nullify the enemy's legal rights, uh, to, to, to go before this just judge we have to have a revelation and faith that god actually is just because i think people are used to uh you know life not being fair one thing i always say is life is not fair because the enemy is roaming about like a roaring lion Mm -hmm. seeking people to devour he's the god of this world life is not fair but god is just so uh, what is it helpful for us then to meditate on on the justice of god i mean we, we, we like to talk about the mercy and we need both but in this instance we don't just need mercy. We're actually seeking justice. So we've got to see God as, as a just God. Absolutely. You know, I think about the scripture in Revelation where it says here is – it talks about uh, those that killed will be killed, those that you know did terrible things that will be done to them. And then it says here is the passion – or excuse me, the patience of the saints. In other words, the idea there – is that there are times we just have patience in life when we're going through stuff, realizing there is a just God who sits on Mm -hmm. the throne, and sooner or later there will be justice into my situation, and I will be vindicated, and I will be justified, and there will be uh, 
you know, payback, and and I'm, and I'm not talking about revenge on people, but I'm talking about like Job getting double back what what he lost. See, see, when Job got back double what he had lost, I believe that that was the justice of God. That was God saying, mm-hmm. "I'm giving you back." Uh, I'm giving you back for everything that you've suffered and everything that you've gone through and everything that, that's happened. I'm, I'm giving it back to you twofold, uh, and that's a ver- I believe it was a verdict from the court of heaven uh, in Job's behalf. Uh, and that was the justice of God that was moving in his behalf. I actually believe the mercy of God is it comes out of the courts of heaven as well, uh, because mercy is a is a, can also be a verdict from the court of heaven. Because he says it says in in the book of James, it says if we haven't shown mercy, uh, we will be judged without mercy. And so so, but if we did show mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. And so I look at that, and I think, okay, one of the best things I can do to to take my position in the courts of heaven is live a merciful life. Because every time I every time I'm merciful, according to Matthew five, he said, "Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy." And so I believe that justice and mercy both flow out of you know verdicts from the courts of heaven. And of course, mercy is a big part of the healing uh, aspect uh, of, of of Jesus. Whenever they would cry out him to him, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. And he would stop. And out of that, out of that merciful heart, he would be able to minister healing to them. Well, yeah, that's that's really good. When the Bible does say to approach the throne of grace boldly to find grace and obtain mercy to help in time of need. So. You know, we're we're sort of really at some level, I just picture ourselves throwing ourselves upon the mercy of the court, knowing that God is just because it's only by the blood of Jesus and it's only in, in, right. by faith in his name and by his blood that we can even receive anything, including healing. Absolutely. I see. I, I mean, I tell people, I say the only way I can have access to the courts is through the blood. Because the blood, according to Hebrews twelve twenty four, is speaking for me, and because it's speaking better things than that of Abel. Because we know Abel's blood cried out for ju- for for judgment against Cain, and and based on the testimony of that blood, God judged him. It was a courtroom activity. But see, Jesus' blood is now speaking in my behalf, and he is giving God all the legal reasons he needs to be able to forgive us. I tell people God has always had a heart to believe, but he needed the legal right to do it from, which is the testimony of the blood. Because in, mm. in the Old Testament, see, in the Old Testament, the priest would go behind the veil with the blood of bulls and goats and just be able to get the sins rolled off the people for a year. And then they'd have to do it every year. But when Jesus' blood was, was spilled, and he took that blood into the real court of heaven, if you will, in heaven, and that blood is there speaking for us, then it is granting God the legal right he always desired to be able to forgive us. And see, that's such a huge thing for me. It wasn't enough that he had a heart to do it, because he always did, but he had to have a legal right to do it from. And that's what the blood gave him. So I come before the courts completely on the basis of the blood of Jesus and what he has done for me. And that, that's so important to emphasize because I think people can, if they're not careful, misunderstand, you know, the revelation that you've received. I know some people probably have misunderstood it. It's, it's, it's only by basis of the blood. It's, it's the atonement. The healing is in the atonement. It, it, it's by the blood of Jesus it's in the name of Jesus. It's, you know, it, by faith in the Son of God. So I, I think that we have to continue or, or, or emphasize or at least I, I'm going to, that it, as you just have, that it, it's because of what Jesus did. It's because of the work of the cross. It's because he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. It's, it's all because of Jesus. And, and it, it, we have, we have. I don't want to say, well, I would say we have a right to be here. When we believe in him, we have, we have, we have a covenant. That's, that's a better way to put it. We have a covenant with a healing God, and healing is our portion. Healing, but even in the Old Testament, you know, it, it, divine healing was and divine health was a was a concept. How much more with this new covenant, this better covenant that we have? We don't have to put up with the enemy. He has legal rights, but we have a covenant, and our covenant trumps his legal rights if we understand how to legislate in the courts of heaven. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm completely completely agree with you. You know, there is a couple of uh, – one other thing that I write in the book that is – to me, it was like um, a uh, revelation. I'll just call it that. 
Um, because I've always thought for years, you know, I was taught and ta- and taught that you know that the devil's the thief and the robber, and that he comes and and of course those are illegal positions. Uh, anytime there's a thief and a robber, there's somebody doing something illegal. But the Lord began to show me, I feel that 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 the devil actually works from both a legal and an illegal position. Uh, mm. For instance, First Peter five eight, he says he is the anti decos He's the one who brings a lawsuit. That's a legal position. Revelation twelve verse ten that the accuser of the brother. That's the Greek word kategoros, and it actually means a, a one who brings a complaint in a judicial system, a complainant at law, a one that would stand against you in the assembly and and you know bring evidence against you and so that's what the word accuser means there so so those two scriptures tell us that the devil is working from a legal place but then we also know he's a thief and a robber and so this is what i tell people i said here's how i minister in healing i said i assume that what god what 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 the enemy is doing in a person's life is illegal there's the thief and the robber is here just you know berating uh, attacking, afflicting with sickness. And and so I approach it from there. So I release the anointing. I, I step into realms of faith. I do all these things, and we see lots of people get healed. But I said, but if they don't get healed, and they're legitimately, you know, reaching out to the Lord and, mm-hmm. and, re- and releasing faith in their own, then I said, I have to consider that maybe what's happening is that this is the enemy doing something from a legal position, and that, and that therefore... I'm going to have to be able to discern what is the legal root of this thing that the enemy is using that's stopping this person from getting healed because I've come to the conclusion that he does things from both a legal and an illegal position. Mm. And if it's if it's an illegal, we just take the anointing and the power of God and we break it and we move on. If it's if it's a legal place, then we might have to stop and say, okay, what is it the enemy is using here? And just real quickly, in Luke uh, chapter 13, one of the best places you see this is when Jesus heals the woman that was bent over for 18 years. It says he looked at her and he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And the word loosed there is apoluo, and it means to cancel a debt, it means to dissolve a contract, and it means to render a divorce. So it's a legal mm-hmm. action. Setting some, and it says that then he touched her. And she was made straight. And I said, I said, Jesus didn't just do things for no reason. I said, when he, he spoke the word that undid the contract the enemy was using to hold her in that condition for 18 years. He, he let her go legally, but then he released the anointing. And I tell people, I said, if you don't get the legal right removed, then it can deny the right of the anointing to have its effect. And I said, because wow. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've mm-hmm. watched people be visibly touched. But still not healed, and I'm thinking, why did or why did this happen? Why did this person die? You know, all that kind of thing. When I when they were visibly touched many times because we we carry anointings and all these kind of things. When I've come to the conclusion that maybe in some of these situations, and I'm I'm very careful because I'm not claiming to have all mysteries solved, but but I I believe with all my heart that Jesus dealt with a legal issue. That had to be dealt with before he could release the anointing to have its effect. And when he did, the, the woman got healed. And there are several other places in the scripture where you see that principle working. But that's 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 the place that, that I believe Jesus was working from in dealing with the legal realm of the enemy uh, at that stage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And see, this is why it's so important to actually study the Word of God and not just read it. And by study it, I mean taking the time to dig out the Hebrew, to dig out the Greek, to read commentaries from, you know, people of days gone by, to to really uh, press in, and then to find those patterns and those principles in Scripture, because, you know, by two or three witnesses, you know, a truth is established. And so, but there's a pattern here with this. I mean, you've given a number of Scriptures already that that demonstrate these these legal terms that, that you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily immediately comprehend that the, the the legal aspect of some of these things if you didn't actually study the Greek and the Hebrew. So it's so important, all you listeners, to actually study what the Bible says and study this for yourself. Don't take anybody's word for it. You see it in Scripture for yourself because then you will have the faith to enter into the courts of heaven and legislate in that in that uh, in that regard. Yes, I mean I, I completely concur and agree with you, uh, Jennifer. I mean the the 
uh, there are such mysteries that are hid, hidden in in the Word of God, and it doesn't matter how many centuries it's been read or how many hundreds or thousands of times we've read it. The Word of God is living. It's alive. Jesus said, my words are, are spirit, and they are life. And, and so because of that, I mean, the Holy Spirit brings out of them just by revelation new understanding, new in, insight, prophetic realms, all that kind of thing. They begin to operate, but then when you when you do when you start, you know, looking into the Greek and into the Hebrew and some of these things because their their language uh, is so much more extravagant than ours um, um, as far as just you know English speaking that you can start uncovering like jewels of of understanding that can unlock new dimensions of the spirit and new dimensions of. Uh, of, of the realms of God that we've never that I you know that that that, I, that maybe we didn't understand by faith some of these things we wouldn't be able to move into. So anyway, mm-hmm. I, I just wholeheartedly agree with that. What what would you say? You know, some Christians don't believe in generational curses or that any kind of curse at all. I, I do because I've I've seen first of all I see it in Scripture. Second of all, I see. Uh, curses working in the lives of, of different people, and I've broken curses off people, bloodline stuff, and, and, and seen deliverance, seen freedom, seen, you know, patterns and struggles broken. Uh, how do we explain that, or what would you say to the one that, that doesn't believe? They say, well, Jesus became a curse for us, you know, so we're, you know, we're, we're not cursed. Uh, what's the best way to explain that realm to somebody? Well, the most simplest way, and that's a great question because that is the thing I get asked the most about. Mm. Um, uh, that is the question out of what I teach. Uh, you know, well, wait a minute. I, I mean, I, some people come up very angry, and I said they want to pat me on my my pointed little head and say, "You poor simple man, you just really don't understand yet." <laughs> and I said, "I said, well, here, here's my here's my because my my." Experience is very similar to yours. I see it in Scripture, but I also see it experientially, not only in my own life, but in the lives of countless hundreds and even thousands now mm-hmm. that have taken these principles and just seen great freedom. And so, so, and then, but, but before I explain that, I tell people, I say, look, I'm not here to argue. I said, but so here's what I would tell you: if what you're doing is bringing you the breakthrough you're looking for, then just keep doing that. And yeah. I said, but if it's not, you might look at this. I said because this brought a, a realm of breakthrough into me and my family that, that that we were being destroyed, and and whenever I discovered and the Lord began to unveil this to me, it just it just changed everything. But here 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 is my point. See, I believe that, like, for instance, Colossians two fourteen, that every handwriting of ordinance that was that was contrary that was against us that was contrary to us, Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Okay, this is what I tell people. That is a stated verdict from the cross. That's mm-hmm. a stated verdict. Okay, uh, Galatians three thirteen, uh, that he became that he became a curse for us. You know, so that there is no for uh, now uh, no more curse. That we're not under mm-hmm. the curse of the law because he became a curse for us. I said that is the stated verdict of the cross. I said, and there are in, there are many. Many other scriptures in the New Testament that would be that as well. Okay, here's, but here's what I tell them. I say the problem is the problem is is that if you don't have a verdict that's executed into place, then that verdict has no power. And and I say when a judge renders a verdict from the bench, which is what actually happened when Jesus died on the cross, there was a verdict rendered against the powers of darkness and everything that would need to be dealt with and everything that was legally set in order. But I said that judge did not come down off that bench and execute in the place. I said he actually, according to John 16, verse 11, sends the Holy Spirit, which convinces us that of judgment for the ruler of this world is judged. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes to empower us as the officers of the court to take the verdict that was rendered and by faith and repentance and all sorts of other things executed into place until we get the full benefit of everything Jesus died for. Because a, a verdict has no power until it's executed into place. And the verdict was rendered at the cross. Now, you say, well, give me a scripture. For that. Okay, let's say Galatians 3.13. He became a curse mm-hmm. for us. Okay, we, so, we would say, so we would teach and say, okay, there is no more curse. Okay, but mm-hmm. then you go over to Revelation 22.3. 22, In the millennial reign of Christ, here's what it says, and there shall be no more curse. So my question is, when did the curse end? Galatians three thirteen or Revelation twenty two three? See, see, the curse ended ends 
in Revelation 22.3, when, when the full execution of the verdict comes into place and all of the earth is set free, there's a new heaven, there's a new earth, everything is in perfect order because every curse has been dealt with. Up until that time, we have to take what Jesus did for us on a personal level, on a family level, on a church level, on a city level, on a cultural level, and execute it into place. Because only at Revelation 20 through 3 will there be a wholesale release of the curse. Up until that time, we're executing the verdict into place that Jesus actually died for. See, that's really easy to understand when you explain it that way. When you were, when you were saying that, I, 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 I had a thought. Mike Bickle has said this many, many times in his teachings over the years. Of He puts it this way, the difference between the legal position and the living condition. And, you know, when, our, when we understand our legal position is we're healed. You know, our, Jesus has executed, you know, God, Father God has executed a verdict. That we're healed. We're whole. We're delivered. You know, sozo. You know, that whole concept yeah. of salvation, including, you know, being prosperous and all of these things, the Greek word means, but sometimes our living condition is not aligning with our <laughs> legal position. And when that's the case, we have to look and say, is this an illegal attack of the enemy or does the enemy have a legal right? And if so, what is that legal right? So then how do you determine the legal right the enemy has? Is that, I'm guessing, through prayer, discernment, looking at fruit? Yes. You know, um, I mean, I put like just about four or five, uh, I think five different things in the book. I mean, because by the time we got things dealt with and all that and got things established. But one, one of the things is, uh, this is where, okay, when I start looking for a legal condition, a, I, a legal issue, I look at my own life first. Okay, what have I done? Is there something in me? Is there, is there some realm that I have you know, stepped into that's given the enemy a legal right to come after me? Uh, um, and because I uh, I deal with those things like like out of Psalms 32 and Psalms 51, David repented for sin, transgression, and iniquity. And sin and transgression are our own stuff. I mean, it's the motives of our heart, it's the words of our mouth, it's our activities. You know, all these it's, it's us stepping across boundaries. But then the word iniquity is actually issues that are in the bloodline that are the legal rights the enemy uses to bring these mm. curses. And, and these issues. So, so I, if I'm going to deal with a curse, you know, it's, I'm probably not going to be real fruitful rebuking the curse. I'm probably going to have to discover the le- any legal thing that's in the bloodline. So, so I look at myself, but, but, and, but this is what I find. Most of the time, people have done that, and I find that – and they can't figure out what, why is this not working for me. I mean I've heard all mm-hmm. the good teaching and all the good preaching, and why am I not getting healed? What is this? And I, again, I've come to, to, to the conclusion that it's because there's a legal thing. Now, just before I go any deeper than that, back we were, we were functioning very heavily – uh, in the healing ministry, seeing lots of good stuff happen. And my wife, Mary, had a dream. And in the dream, the voice of God spoke in the dream and said to her, Tell Robert, if he does not pray for them correctly, they will die. Mm. And she tells me this. And I like I, I get frustrated. I go, what am I, what am I supposed to do with that? I mean, I, I, I was doing the best I knew how. I, I was doing all these kind of things. Well, it wasn't until I discovered the court of heaven and the legal realm that I immediately thought about that word. I thought, okay, this is what the Lord was saying, that, that, that there were, the reason people don't get healed in spite of everything that's working in their, in their behalf is because the enemy had something legal against them, and quite often it's connected to the bloodline uh, that is giving him a legal right to visit this thing upon them or even up on generations previous to them or after them or whatever it may be. And we even see that. I mean, we even mm-hmm. see that happen uh, in, in people's lives. I mean, I can't tell you how many times somebody has been afflicted with cancer, and I'll, I'll say, well, anybody in your family line? Well, yeah, my mother had well, and what, and my grandmother. And, and it's like, you know, it may not be the exact same thing, but it's something cancerous that is very clearly moving from generation to generation. And so I said, I said okay, we, we need to figure out what's allowing this thing in the first place. What is the legal mm-hmm. right the enemy is using to be able to afflict you from generation to generation and, and even take you out prematurely? There's, there's got to be something here that's happening. And, um, um, and, you know, in our culture, 
uh, in our culture, we really don't. I mean, we don't know our generations. For instance, when I'm over in the in the Asian country, these people know their generation. Yeah. Because I would say to them, I would say to them, I would say, okay, here, here's this, and they say, oh yeah, I was dedicated to this god. My grandmother took me to this temple and dedicated me to this god. I mean, it's no big secret. And it's like, and I'm like, well, we're going to have to undo that because that thing now says it owns you. It says that you were dedicated, therefore you are owned by it, and it's claiming you and your bloodline for its purposes. Uh, it, I said this has nothing to do with whether you go to heaven or not. It has, has everything to do with the level of heaven you experience in the earth. And, and so I would have to lead them through these issues of dealing with their, their bloodlines, that any place that there was something that was allowing the enemy a legal right to claim them. And, of course, I just kind of jumped ahead because that's what trades, covenants, and dedications are all about. Wow. And, see, that's a whole deep topic. I know you go into a lot more of that in the book. So uh, we'll yes. let them pick up that. But how has – let me ask you one more question. How has your revelation of the courts of heaven – uh, grown or changed since you first started sick? Because you've been you've been pressing into this for years. How how is how, you know? Is, is, are you still learning? Oh oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm under contract right now. I don't have any books, but 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 yes, it has changed changed drastically. Here's here's what I would say. When I first saw it, uh, and because of the some of the influence I was under, I I tended to be. I look back now and realize I was legalistic with it um, mm. in, in the sense of, of um, not really understanding the place that grace plays into this. And so I now feel, I now have, understand that, that I come before the courts out of, like we said earlier, out of his blood, out of his grace, and that, that I have a right to stand there uh, uh, you know, out of out of all that realm, and so I'm much more grace filled. I'm much more um, uh, blood oriented. I'm much more aware in the courts of what He has done for us and why I can function here in the first place. And and so that's been a really drastic change. And being able to silence anything the enemy would be using uh, out not, not so much, not even. Well, I mean, I feel like we have to repent to agree with what Jesus has done, but but I'm really silencing the enemy based on 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 the work of Jesus. I'm, I mean, all that and all that speaking in my behalf out of the courts of heaven, which uh, so much of it is listed in Hebrews twelve twenty two through twenty four, where the blood speaking and the mediator of the new covenant is speaking and. The cloud of witnesses um, and the spirits of just men and and you know all these kind of things and many other things that are just working in behalf of God's purposes and me in the earth. So I'm much more aware of that today than I was when I first began, you know, many years ago. Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny how how the Lord teaches us as we go and how we have a a partial revelation and a fuller revelation. I just think it never ends as we study the Word of God, like He said. It's alive. Uh, it's sharp. It, it pierces between soul and spirit. It divides between soul and spirit, rather. So it's it's it's, it's something that uh, I imagine you'll have other books as uh, the years go by on this same on this same topic because there's so much there. I mean, for scripture, uh, and, you know, it's just it's inexhaustible. The treasures within it. So it, it, I it is. I mean, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I want to make sure that if you had anything else you wanted to share, I want to let you do that. I don't want to keep you all night, but I would like to give you – if I didn't ask you about anything that you wanted to talk about, please do uh, share. Well, you know, the only thing that – only other thing I was going to say is that I have now come – see, at one point when you get a hold of a revelation, it's like the court of heaven, which is still a big, big piece of what I do and travel all over the world doing it. Because, you know, I think – well, I've been doing this for like eight years – but there's still a big, big world out there that is finding out about it and 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 realizing the breakthroughs connected to it. But what I've come to understand is that the court of heaven is simply one spiritual dimension. See, I believe – I mean I have pinpointed at least eight spiritual dimensions that are mentioned in Scripture uh, that when we pray – see, this is what I tell people. I say when we pray, and I say we all know what it is to feel the presence of God, and I said mm -hmm. but – I, for years and years and years, I would say, man, this morning prayer or in worship, God's presence was so great. 
But I said, now I have a different perspective. I said, yes, it is the presence of God, but it is a spiritual dimension I'm stepping into. And if I can recognize where I am in the spirit, then I can operate in the protocol of that dimension and see breakthrough come. Because I tell people, I said, prayer is not trying to convince God to do something for you. I said, prayer is stepping into a spiritual realm and moving things around in that spiritual dimension so heaven can invade earth. And so I now see that even though it's a big major realm of the spirit, I believe the courts of heaven is simply one realm. I believe the counsel of the Lord is a realm. I believe the secret place is a realm. I believe the throne of grace is a realm. I mean, there's, there's, and there's many others in Scripture where there are different realms of the Spirit that when we pray, we can begin to step into these places. And so when I'm praying, I'm, mm-hmm. I try to be conscious of this. I say, okay, Lord, where am I in the Spirit right now? Because as I'm in this place, I want to agree with you. I want to do what you're doing here because if I'll do what you're doing, then I'm then we're going to get things we, we together are going to get things moved so that so that a manifestation of heaven can come into the earth. And I believe that's what we do whether we're praying, whether we're leading a service, whether we're in a worship setting or whatever. I think if we would be more aware of that, we would we we could see greater demonstrations of of heaven impact earth. Yes, because how can two walk together unless they're agreed? So yes. understanding the will of the Lord and really agreeing with it, rooting out the doubt, rooting out the unbelief, understanding uh, the, the spiritual dimensions that, you know, what we don't see is more real than what we do see, and what we do see will eventually fade away, but the Word of God in the spirit realm is uh, perpetual. So it, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. Uh, unlocking healing in the courts of heaven you can uh, get that uh, on destiny images website you can get it on amazon uh, uh, apostle robert do you have a website where you're also selling it or doing autograph copies yes Ro- yeah robert henderson.org my name.org and um uh and of course all of our materials are there and and everything but uh uh yeah so anyway the book is receiving healing from the courts of heaven uh and I'm just really excited about the impact potentially that that's going to have. I just really am looking forward to hearing testimonies from people that took the principles and got healed. Because, see, before I even wrote it, people were taking the principles out of the first two books and getting healed mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. saw how it applied. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing that, that people took just the truths and applied them and began to step into those places and healing began to manifest in their lives. Right, because the principles work. And Dutch Sheets wrote the foreword, and I know that he speaks highly yeah. of the book as well. So that's uh, it's always good to have to have Dutch's uh, amen on something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> are, are you planning other Courts of Heaven books? Are you sort of still digging around in that? Well, we have. I just we have a one coming out at some point here called uh, the Cloud of Witnesses and the Courts of Heaven. I mean, and how the Cloud of Witnesses functions in the realm because there it's a very real place and then we have one i just turned in called prayers and declarations to open the courts of heaven and so yeah and we've got to, we're going to do one on wealth and some uh, different things so there's there's quite a few more because um we we, we i don't even think we've got close to exhausting the the idea and the concepts because i find out once you know once you know the idea and then once you kind of understand the realm uh, learning how to function in that. For instance, I did a teaching in the first year, how to how to uh, get your prophetic word into reality from the courts of heaven. Uh, that we mm. need to understand the reason the prophetic word hasn't come to pass so often is because something legal is resisting it in the realm of the spirit. So we have to know how to take that word, present it before the Lord in the courts for that word to begin to be become reality in the earth and reality in our life. So... So it's just, wow. it's just kind of like a, a non. It's just I, I don't. At this point, I don't hardly see an end to uh, to what we can touch and what we can, you know, express concerning some of this. Yeah, that's it's it's fascinating for sure. I can't wait to get my copy. Would you mind just praying for our audience before before we go tonight? Absolutely, thank you, Lord Father. I just want to thank you, even as we just had an opportunity just to share and talk, Father. And I pray that faith would be stirred, um, Lord, that, and that it would be a faith that would be mixed with the word, Father, that, that would cause, Lord, breakthroughs to come tonight. I pray that there are those that have listened to this 
that maybe they never thought about it, they haven't heard it, and it's, it, it, it's caused their curiosity to arise. But there's others that the, even as the word was spoken, that faith just re, has, has risen. And I say that even as that has taken place, that it is initiating a breakthrough for them. Lord, that even as the children of Israel, it says that they did not cross over into the land because the word preached to them wasn't mixed with faith. But I declare this word that has been spoken is mixed with faith, and people are moving out of the place they've been held in, Lord, even a wilderness place, and they're coming into, Lord, the land of promise that has been made for them, whatever that means to them. I thank you for doing this, Lord, and that that their lives will begin to change, Father, even out of this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Fascinating. I could talk with you about this stuff for hours, but I want to let you go. Remember, everyone, get your copy of the book. If this uh, piqued your interest, uh, be sure to get your copy. It's number one right now in new releases, and I'm sure it'll stay there uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks to come. Every time you put out a new book, it always hits number one. So, <laughs> yeah, we've been uh, blessed. Yeah, you have been blessed. Apostle Robert, I thank you so much for taking the time. I know you could be anywhere. Thank you for sharing and encouraging our listeners tonight, and and hopefully we'll catch up soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Bless you. All right, bless you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.